Good afternoon and welcome. I'm very grateful uh, that you are here today. Um, my name is Ricky Rivez. I'm on the faculty at NYU Law School, where I served as dean from 2002 to 2013. And at NYU, I'm also the director of the Institute for Policy Integrity, uh, a think tank and environmental advocacy organization that's one of the co-sponsors for today's event. And I'm really delighted that you're all here. Uh, we plan this uh, panel series to help bring attention to the importance of diversity, equity, and inclusion in the environmental law field. Uh, in January, we kicked off this series uh, with Congresswoman Yvette Clark, who spoke with us about the significance of diversity in our profession. We were also joined by DEI experts from the private and public side, who spoke about steps already being taken at many firms and NGOs. A link to the recording of that event is available on our registration page, and I highly recommend that uh, panel to all the attendees today. So this is our second panel, and we hope you'll also join us on April 15th for our third panel, which will focus on an important current environmental justice challenge, the implementation of the equity provisions of New York's Climate Leadership and Community Protection Act. So now we'll turn over the proceedings to Bethany davis Knoll, uh, the Executive Director of the State Energy and Environmental Impact Center at NYU Law School, who was previously my longtime policy integrity colleague. Bethany will give us a roadmap uh, for the event. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ricky. Thanks so much for that introduction and for you know, highlighting our other panels. I, along with my NYU role and um, the, you know, the work I've done for many years with Ricky, I'm also co-chair with Margaret Berry of the Environmental Law Committee um, at, the NY, at the New York City Bar. And we're just um, so happy to have you all here to join us in this, in this panel series. This is um, the second panel in our three-part series on building power in the environmental law movement. And I'm going to start by introducing our amazing group of panelists today and then provide a roadmap. So first off, what we're gonna do is we have Sam Sankar, Senior Vice President from Earth Justice, who will join us to provide opening remarks. And there'll be a few minutes for a question and answer with him. And then we have four amazing panelists with us who will engage in a conversation with Adrian Alicea, the Deputy Director of Green 2.0, who is our moderator and um, will organize that, um, that conversation. So our panelists that will join Adrian are Marissa Blackshire, Senior Director of Environmental Compliance and EHNS at Bloom Energy, Courtney Bowie, Managing Attorney of the Northeast Office of Earth Justice, Jonathan Wabarocha, Lead Regulatory Counsel at Xerox Healthcare LLC, and Roy Prather III, at the, a Principal at Beverage and Diamond. And now I'm gonna turn this over to Sam to get us started, but uh, after I give him a little intro, actually. actually. Um, Sam is Earth Justice's Senior Vice President for Programs, and he's been working on environmental issues throughout his career as an engineer in the Justice Department, in the private sector, and when he was counsel to the Presidential Commission that investigated the Deepwater Horizon spill. He now leads Earth Justice's program leadership team which develops and oversees strategy in all of the organization's major departments. And we're so grateful to have him join us this afternoon to talk about how organizations can support diverse staff and the contributions they make every day in the workplace. Okay, turning it over to you, Sam. Sure, uh, I'm gonna make this uh, relatively brief, very brief, I hope. Um, and just to expand a little bit on the background that Beth, Bethany very kindly provided, um, I've had uh, a background in many different sectors that we'll be talking about today. Uh, I've worked uh, at the Justice Department in the Environment and Natural Resources Division. I worked in-house at General Electric, where I ran environmental health and safety uh, at, at that organization. Um, and uh, I worked in, in big law. I did, a, did some time in big law. Now I'm at a nonprofit. And that gives me a little bit of perspective on what it means for a person who's a person of color to come and work in the environmental, as an environmental attorney, um, and also what the organizations that want to bring in more people of color um, should be thinking about and why they might wanna do it. So I wanted to, to focus on those two questions. Number one, why should organizations care about hiring people of color into these kinds of jobs, into this field? And number two, why should people of color be interested 
in working on environmental issues and be interested in working as an attorney. Um, the the lesson, the, the, the phrase that stuck with me, I, when I worked at GE, I worked a, a bunch with the, the CEO of the healthcare business there. Um, and he was a huge uh, supporter, ally, um, and champion for GE's LGBTQ community. And one day I asked him, I said, okay, so how did you get started in this? You're an older white guy, straight, you know, like what got you into this? And he, he said, for me, it's math. It's about talent. If I'm looking at the broadest array of people who are out there who can do the jobs that I need to get done, I'm going to have a competitive advantage. This guy was all nuts and bolts and dollars and cents. But that lesson has stuck with me that, that the reason organizations should be looking for people of color is because of the talent. And uh, a woman named Jamila Frone, who's uh, our VP for litigation practice, says it all the time. If you want excellence in your organization, you need to have diversity because that's, where, that's the way you get excellence. And study after study has shown that when you have a diverse workforce, it's a more productive workforce. That doesn't mean it's an easier workforce. And I think that's a lesson for a lot of organizations. They think we can just have it a little, we can just look different and all of a sudden we'll be better. We don't have to do any of the work behind the scenes that it's gonna to take to make us a great organization that is also a diverse organization. That's a lesson that every organization out there that any of you might be thinking about working at uh, will be, we'll be dealing with even organizations like ours that have a significant number of people of color in them. And I wouldn't, can't let a minute pause without, uh, pass without touting Earth Justice in this respect a little bit. We're very proud of the progress we've made so far. Our full-time staff are now 44% people of color. Our senior leadership is more than half people of color. And our board members, which is where we lag, and some, and, you know, to be honest, is 27%. So, um, we see the excellence that people of color bring to our organization. I mean, I look in the mirror and see it, and it makes a difference. Um, but again, I think anybody who, who's in this field and goes to work for an organization that's looking for that kind of excellence has to recognize that every organization is going to be learning and growing as it tries to make itself more diverse. Now, the second question is, why should a person who's a person of color care about working as an environmental attorney? There's a thousand things we could all be doing. And, you know, there's no mechanical answer that's going to convince you all, but I think everybody on this call, uh, everybody who's on this call, everybody's on this webinar has the seed of a recognition in there that this is the issue of our time, in my view. This is an existential crisis for humanity across the board. We need to figure out how to make our uh, our species compatible with the planet in every possible way, whether that's on the biodiversity front, the energy front, the pollution front, you name it. And if you're a person, you should care about these issues. If you're a person of color, you should care about them a lot because these issues are disproportionately affecting our communities. When I grew up, I used to go to India every year, every other year, and I would go and I'd say, why is America like so much cleaner with less trash and less pollution and the air doesn't stink? Why is it so different? Well, we have strong environmental laws, but the reality is that's not the case everywhere in America. In suburban Massachusetts, where I grew up, the air was clean, the water was pretty clean, there wasn't a lot of incinerators around. That is not true all of, throughout this country. And as we all know, probably everybody on this call knows, and I don't need to rattle through a bunch of statistics, pollution, toxic waste, toxic uh, products, and toxic exposures are disproportionately visited on communities of color around the country. If you care about the environment and you're a person of color, you should care about the way that our communities are disproportionately affected by this. It also turns out to be a really great career. You'll hear from other people here. We, we, we did the prep call. A lot of folks here talked about the, the great things that they've done in, the career, in their careers and the interesting things they've gotten to learn about. So I'll leave it there and we can move on to the, the, the questions either for me or for others. But I wanted to thank uh, the folks who organized this event for making it available. I think it's, uh, it, it's great that we can help, uh, help others come along into this great field. Thank you, Sam. Thank you so much for those comments. And I want to tell everybody, you know, watching this webinar that the Q&A is open for questions. So please submit your questions there. And, you know, um, while we wait for those questions, maybe I'll take uh, organizers prerogative to ask my own question of Sam. So maybe just, I, I just, maybe make, I'll make it a little personal. You know, what is it for you that kind of keeps you going about this job? You know, like, I don't, not, I don't know that this happens to you, but let's, do you ever feel downhearted and what is it that keeps you going? And 
maybe give us like a specific example of something that's been really sort of exciting in your career either recently or um, that you want to tell us about. Sure. Um, I can't help but talk about this and, and plug Life at Earth Justice because it's pretty good. I've been here for, for two years now, um, which is sort of amazing when I think about it. But um, first of all, in any job for everybody, the thing that gets you going every day is the people you work with. I don't care what it is you do for a living. My brother is a doctor. I got, you know, I have good friends who are woodworkers and plumbers. Everybody cares about the people they work with. So that's something I tell everybody when you look for a job, look for people who are going to make you want to come to work or virtually come to work every day. So that's what keeps me going. Courtney and I, uh, you know, we work together and just the, the chance to see her on the page or on the screen is, is a good enough reason to do it. Now, what keeps me going when times are tough and when uh, things are, are bad. Um, you got to have a bit of a flywheel in this in this work. You got to let the good stuff spin you up and use that momentum to carry you through the tough days. I think that's true about life, the universe, and everything as well. Um, you know, reading the news can get you down. I like to read our victory reports to keep me up. Yeah, that that's uh, that's good advice. Um, okay, one more question. So. You know, we did hear about Earth Justice's specific DEI practices at the at our last event, and it was fascinating and so useful. And I was wondering if there are specific practices around DEI that you're most proud of at Earth Justice, or some highlights that you can give us. Yeah, well, there's a couple of things. Um, I don't think any of this is rocket science. Um, we we talk a lot about it. We talk a lot about it, and that makes it normal to talk about it. It makes it okay to talk about it. Doesn't make it easy, but we acknowledge also that having those conversations is going to be difficult. So it is a frequent topic of conversation, in part because our work so frequently intersects with racism, which is something I forgot to mention in my opening remarks. That that so much of the environmental degradation really intersects with racism. So we have natural reasons for it to be a topic of conversation, um, and I will say it is not always an easy topic of conversation. And I think we lean into the difficulty. So. Um, I would say the thing I'm most proud of is that we never let ourselves off the hook on this. Never. I don't know. Courtney may, Courtney may, <laughs> maybe there's other things that Courtney, yeah, there you go. <laughs> Thumbs up from her on that. I, we appreciate that so much. Um, thank you so much for getting us started here, Sam. This is a very um, energetic way to get this panel going. And so now I'd like to turn this over to Adrian. Um, the new deputy director at Green 2.0 to introduce the panelists and moderate the discussion. Thanks, Adrian. Thanks, Stephanie. Hi, I'm Adrian Alisea. I'm deputy director of Green 2.0. For those who don't know, we're a watchdog in the environmental movement. We want to ensure that environmental organizations and foundations are not only hiring people of color, but they're creating work cultures and climates that support, develop, retain, promote staff of color at every level, um, but especially in leadership where decision-making happens for organizations. So we're just really thrilled to be here today. I'm really excited to actually get started. So I'm gonna first ask our really wonderful panel if they can just tell me their names, where they work, where they're joining us today from, and let's just go Jonathan, Courtney, Sam, Roy, Marissa. And if you forget, I'll tell you, I'll remind you. <laughs> sure, I'll, I'm happy to go first. My name's uh, Jonathan Wabarucha. I wear many hats, um, including the, the senior counsel role for Xerox Healthcare LLC. I'm also the uh, ehs and um, consultant, or excuse me, ehs and counsel for Xerox Corporation. Uh, I'm based in Rochester, New York. And, you know, we'll get into this a little bit, but that's not where I started. I started working for a nonprofit re representing families with lead poisoned children, which then led me to work for a Belgian consultancy which took me to Belgium for a couple of years. And now I'm at Xerox based in Rochester. So to Sam's point, like these careers, it's amazing where an environmental career will, will take you. And, and that's, that's it for my introduction, that's it. Thanks, Jonathan. Courtney? Good afternoon. My name is Courtney Bowie. Um, I'm the managing attorney for the Northeast Office of Earth Justice. And we're based in New York City. And um, like Jonathan, I came here by way of being a racial justice attorney for the American Civil Liberties Union. And immediately prior to coming to Earth Justice last year, uh, well, 13 months ago, um, I was the legal director for the ACLU of South Dakota um, and did a lot of work with the indigenous tribes out there and really pleased to be a part of this panel this afternoon. Thanks. Sam, folks will get reintroduced to you, but if you could also. <laughs> 
Sure. I'm the Senior VP for Earth Justice. I'm based in Washington, D.C., and I've been here for a couple of years after having been at uh, the Justice Department, corporations, and private practice. Roy? Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Roy Prather. I am a principal at Beverage and Diamond, which is the oldest and largest private law firm dedicated exclusively to the practice of environmental law. Um, I am based in Baltimore, but the firm is based in DC. Um, and I am also the chair of our Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Committee. Um, and you'll hear a bit more about it later, but I've been at Beverage and Diamond for about six years, but started my career at a different private law firm doing something totally different. Um, but I can share more about that when we get into the uh, discussion. Marissa. Hi, Marissa Blackshire, Senior Director of Environmental Compliance and EHS at Bloom Energy, which is a clean energy company. We have a fuel agnostic platform that provides zero and near zero energy solutions. Um, prior to Bloom, I worked for BNSF Railway. I've worked at a small law firm. I've worked in big law, and I've been practicing in this area for about 15 years. Thanks so much, everyone. I'm just going to get right into the questioning. Um, first, what drew you to the practice of environmental law? And can you tell us where your journeys began? I'm going to ask Courtney to answer this question first. So I actually started out um, in, I went to law school to be a civil rights lawyer. And I started my career in a defense firm, uh, mainly to in Boston to to pay off some debt, but then uh, transitioned down to Southern Poverty Law Center in Montgomery, Alabama. And that was the only office SPLC had at the time. And my journey to environmental law was, was kind of a long one, but I think it, it, it makes perfect sense to me. And when I was coming to Earth Justice and people are asking me why I was changing careers, I'm like, it's, it's actually the same work. Um, when I was with SPLC, uh, in Alabama, I was covering cases in Mississippi, Louisiana, Alabama on behalf of mostly children of color who had special needs and um, they were exposed to all kinds of toxins in areas in Alabama that are just as ended up getting involved in people didn't even have plumbing still and they were using septic tanks and um, their just infrastructure was different based upon you know, who you were and mostly it broke down along race lines in, in the deep south, as you can imagine. Um, this is also, I was in, um, I was representing students in Jefferson Parish right outside of New Orleans when the, the hurricane struck and um, kind of the recovery there, well, so-called recovery for some people um, didn't go too well. And um, there wasn't much recovery and there was a lot of loss of life. So it's kind of familiar with what was happening, but not really laser focused on it. When I went to the ACLU to work for the racial justice program, I began re representing uh, indigenous tribes in South Dakota. And that's what I've done for the last 10 years or so on different issues, um, mostly race discrimination claims. Um, but in, when I became the legal director in South Dakota in 2015, it was a year before the Standing Rock Sioux tribe stood up um, to protest the Dapple pipeline. And we, you know, we weren't expecting that. We covered North Dakota also, by the way, because the states have very small populations. And the tribes had been telling me the thing that they cared about, you know, was not like, you know, what I was like kind of pushing them to worry, be worrying about, which is the use of the N-word against the children at ball games and you know, kind of the educational equity issues. They're like, we're worried about water. And um, it really kind of opened my eyes because we couldn't take a position directly on the, you know, whether or not the pipeline was a good idea. But, you know, I'm a, I'm a believer in community lawyering and racial justice. And the racial justice issue was and is environmental justice. And the decision to put the pipeline in North Dakota was, you know, literally made initially to the pipeline was initially going above the city of Bismarck, North Dakota, and that's a predominantly white city. And it was moved and placed directly above the water intake for the Standing Rock Sioux tribe. And this is a, an area um, historically where that's where Custer left from that fort to go to the Black Hills and seize it. I mean, there's some history there that really kind of made the whole thing really fraught and awful. And when I got involved in 2016, it was an incredibly, you know, utopian peaceful protest. And, you know, news reports that indicate otherwise have to do with 
the oil companies sending goons out to cause trouble because we were representing people who were praying that the pipeline wouldn't contaminate their water and representing their right to protest. But the real work, the real important piece was being handled by our justice and um, handled really well. And they were trying to stop the permitting so that the pipeline couldn't cross the Missouri River and put the water at risk. And that's when I you know, decided like ultimately I would wanna be at Earth Justice if I got the opportunity. And I came back to New York and um, luckily Earth Justice was looking for someone in New York. And so um, that's my long journey from racial justice to environmental justice. Like I said, I see them as almost exactly the same thing. Like there's, from a Venn diagram standpoint, there's almost 80% overlap between the work that I do now, keeping people safe from toxins, keeping water safe, keeping food safe, um, and working on climate goals. It impacts people of color. Like Sam said, there's, there's a huge overlap between racism and environmental justice. So it's an, it's an honor and a privilege to work with agencies and work in the courts to try to ensure that our nation's environmental laws are upheld. And it's, like I said, it's what I've spent my entire career doing and I would highly recommend that, you know, like if you're gonna get into anything, this is the thing to get into because there isn't, this is an existential crisis and it's, you know, it impacts all of us. Thank you, Courtney. That was a really powerful way to open us up. Um, Roy, can you also tell us a little bit more about your journey where it began? I could certainly try. Um, I'm, I'm still <laughs> kind of absorbing really how moving Courtney's journey was. Mine was much simpler and uh, much less in inspiring, honestly. <laughs> um, when I was in law school, uh, unlike Courtney, who, who definitely seemed to be very focused and had a goal and knew what she wanted to do, I had absolutely no idea other than I knew I liked litigation. Um, and so I had no exposure to environmental law, even though there was an environmental program at my law school. I went to Georgetown um, and kind of just checked off the courses that people said, hey, you should take this because it might be helpful when you have a job once you get out of law school. Um, and so I, following along everyone else, I immediately jumped to a big law job after I finished um, and went to work at a law firm in Philadelphia where I was doing a wide range of litigation defense for um, corporations, essentially uh, patent, trademark, copyright uh, litigation, but also commercial litigation and a little bit of uh, financial services litigation, just a whole grab bag. And for me, that was great because I just wanted the experience, but subject matter wise, um, it wasn't as fulfilling as I might've hoped it would be just because the vast majority of those cases, you're just fighting over how money gets distributed among a bunch of rich people, right? You know, you've got this large corporation arguing with this other large corporation that I should get this much and you should get less. And, you know, those can be interesting, but over time it, it, you just, I'll say I just uh, reached a point where it wasn't as satisfying to be kind of working those cases day in, day out. Um, and so I was looking to make um, kind of a transition after about five or six years doing that work um, and was looking, I had moved because uh, my wife relocated um, and basically was open to whatever opportunities were available. And I just happened to be put in touch with the chairman of Beverage and Diamond, uh, Ben Wilson, who you know, was great about putting me in touch with opportunities at all different firms. And, and that was awesome. And I was interviewing and then he called me up one day and was like, well, have you given any thought to environmental law? And the truth is, I really hadn't. And so he was like, well, I'll send you some things, do some research because we could use kind of a, a litigation associate. It, it might be a, a good opportunity for you and we can talk more about it. And so I, I did that. I did some research. I started talking to people. Um, he put me in touch with some people. And what, what really kind of ultimately drew me in was one, seeing the type of litigation that you see in, in environmental cases, whether it's enforcement related or, you know, citizen suits, is that, you know, they're all very highly technical, right? So they're always involving chemistry issues, technical issues, engineers, experts, things like that. And so on the practicing side, it was very appealing to me in terms of, you know, you're always going to be learning something new because you're going to be kind of translating for the court. Here's Here's what happens to this to the groundwater when you know it comes into contact with this um, constituent. Here's how that might what it looks like when that migrates. Here's what it looks like when such and such chemical is processed and there are scrubbers to you know affect the emissions. Um, and so that was appealing. And then on a more fundamental level, um, the scale and the scope of what effect you can have just being involved in those types of matters. Um, 
kind of really impressed me in the sense that it's not just moving money back and forth. Like money can be involved for sure, but the decisions that your clients are making that are involved with the people involved in those matters, those directly affect the lives of the people um, that work for those companies, the people that live around where those companies operate. And also we represent municipalities as well. So cities and, and towns where they are specifically trying to address concerns of, of their constituents. And so, you know, it was kind of the perfect storm for me. Um, and, you know, selfishly also wanting to build a practice in private law, looking and saying, okay, these issues are going to be at the forefront of everyone's minds now until forever, because we're so far behind addressing all of the issues that exist, that there's going to be new science developed, new regulations, new rules, new requirements that we're always going to need lawyers to either help influence what is created, help interpret what gets created, help revise what's already been created. And so it also selfishly is like, here's an opportunity for me to do more work, yay. Um, and so, it, like I said, it was kind of a perfect storm of you know, practical practice of, that's interesting to me, as well as um, being able to have a, a meaningful impact on issues beyond just you know, shifting money around from one company to another. Um, and so, like I said, not quite so inspirational, but I think, you know, also a, an important consideration for somebody early in their career thinking about, you know, what matters to them, what they want to see themselves doing long term. So I hope that was kind of a useful additional perspective there. That was just as insightful, Roy, so we appreciate it. <laughs> All of us have had, um, you know, colleagues, sponsors, mentors who helped us along our way in our careers. What's the best advice you've received or the most help you've received from someone along the way in your journey and maybe who was it from um, and who really had an impact on you? Sam, can you kick us off on this question? Yeah, um, I have lots of different mentors and, and folks along the way, but the, the, there's a piece of advice that really sticks out in my mind. Uh, and it was from, of all people, Sonia Sotomayor. I was taught, this is a long time ago, it was 20, 20 years ago, I met her when she was a, a second circuit judge and I was applying for clerkships. And it was very exciting, like all these people, it was really kind of cool and all that. And she was eating lunch with her clerks and uh, I walked in the door and she said, uh, where are you coming from? I said, from, from DC and I interviewed with a judge down there. And she said, you know, judges are a dime a dozen and they all probably look the same from your, your point of view. Go work for somebody you like go work for somebody you like. And that piece of advice led me to go work for a judge who I quite liked out in the ninth circuit. Um, and it stuck with me. You're going to do well along the way if you work for people you like working for. Um, because the way you succeed in this field, in any field, is by doing good work, impressing people, and, uh, and showing what you're made of. And you're going to do that a lot better when you're working for somebody you like. So um, I've had a couple of folks like that along the way. Um, I'm lucky enough to work for somebody like that right now, and to have, and to have uh, the very fortunate position of having mentors who, it, throughout my organization, there's a couple of people who I call all the time. One of them, a woman of color, who's a managing attorney, who's who's often, uh, you know, whose ear I often bend. It's just, you know, how should I think through this, and what's the right thing to do? So, one thing to think about is to look for mentors, not just like, you know, senior people, whatever, further down your career, but especially once you get a little further down your own career, you got to find them in other places. That is to say, when you get old, you start having to look for younger mentors. I think that's great advice, Sam. Jonathan, can you give us some insight? Sure. And can I first? I'm gonna I'm gonna out myself as an environmental nerd because um, listening to uh, Rory and, and Courtney, I have to say I've always wanted a career related to the environment. I was that kid who watched Captain Planet, and I'm like, I'm Kwame Earth. Like for some reason, I I caught that bug. And so I didn't know what that career would be and it evolved over time. <clears throat> and I'm gonna go yada, 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 I'm an environmental attorney now. But there's a lot in there that went into that. But for some reason at a young age, the idea and the concept of laws and regulations and activities that we do that can both harm and help the earth, I caught that bug. And I've always wanted a career in like environmental law. So, um, when, so, that, I had to get that out of the way for folks who might also be in that same boat, not exactly knowing where they belong, um, but also knowing you have this passion. 
And so that brings me to the first piece of advice, which is don't panic. Um, and that's my advice. And then I'm going to get to my men a mentor's advice. Um, don't panic in the sense that one, you don't know exactly what you want. No, you know what you want to do. Two, if you don't have a mentor, because growing up again from that young age, I didn't see attorneys, environmental attorneys, especially who look like me. And so figuring out like where I belong was a little difficult, but along the way you do start to develop those relationships. So that's one, that's just my advice. Like don't panic. It takes time to figure out where you belong to develop those relationships, which is then the second piece of advice. And Roy's already mentioned Ben Wilson, who um, I know has mentored a lot of people, but one piece of advice he had for me is as you go along and start your career and even your career, you know, you become a seasoned um, environmental practitioner, develop genuine relationships with people. Um, it, it, it becomes quickly apparent when you're developing a relationship just for the function of it <laughs> or the benefit you get, you get from that relationship. Approach it from the perspective of, I want to get to know you better, regardless of whatever you're going to get out of that. I want to get to know you. So be genuine in how you reach out and you network with individuals um, because it shows. And, and you'd be surprised, especially when you start meeting people through um, bar associations and, and, and other, or other organizations, the folks who you might actually have the best relationships with, you may end up opposing them on a matter. But it's amazing how better that experience will, will be because of that relationship you developed. It's still going to be contentious. You're still going to argue the facts. But at the end of the day, developing those genuine relationships are going to benefit you, your client. Uh, and I think it's just an all around win. So that was the, the best piece of advice that Ben gave me and that I've, I've tried developing over time. And again, don't panic, <laughs> develop genuine relationships. Thanks, Jonathan. Courtney, do you have any insights you want to share with us? Um, yes. I. I, I mean, I'm, I don't want to say exactly who gave me this, but I've had, I've been blessed with a number of great mentors throughout my career, and um, a particular mentor at the ACLU um, gave me some advice that I thought was really useful, and that was um, the law tends to attract type A type of people, um, and I think we're all really um, committed to doing excellent work and being perfect and winning all of our cases. And sometimes that stops us and it stops us from doing what needs to be done. And I think by that, what he was trying to tell me was like, and he explicitly got to this, which was be courageous. And, you know, winning isn't always the objective here. You know, you have to file some cases that you may lose because we have to file this case on behalf of these people who've been horribly wronged. And sometimes, you know, like it starts with filing a case to push the court or push an agency or push public opinion a certain way. So if you're winning 100% of the time, you're not pushing the law. And it was a real revelation for me because I, did want to always win and thought it would harm my career to, you know, not be courageous, but to be kind of safe. And I stopped being safe and it helped me a lot. So I would say, you know, be courageous, both in your career choices, if you want to do something, and also on a micro level in what you choose to take on, if you think it's the right thing, and it's, it's going to help people. Thank you, Courtney. Roy, do you have anything you'd like to add as well? Sure, I, I'm, I don't want to uh, uh, repeat, but I do want to highlight the importance of, of what Jonathan mentioned, which is the, the relationship piece. I think the best advice I got, um, and <laughs> I've had it from a number of mentors, in, including Ben Wilson, who, who Jonathan mentioned before, but it, it was never underestimate the value of being helpful to other people, right? Whether that's you know, if some if you're in law school and someone's interested in going to the school that you're attending and they reach out and say, hey, can you share a little bit about what your experience has been, what you like, what you don't like? And, you know, taking 15, 20 minutes to have a conversation with that person. I can tell you from experience, I did that. 10 years later, that person was a client, right? Um, I had no idea where they were gonna go to law school. They didn't end up attending where I went to school. I had no idea where they went to work after they graduated from law school, but they remembered that. And the nice thing about it was, you know, I did that without any expectation of getting anything in return. But what you find is you will feel a whole lot better about yourself knowing that 
you know, you've made connections with people as you go through your career that have enriched you, but you've also been able to kind of enrich other people's careers in the terms of, you know, whether it's um, just sharing experiences like we're doing now for people or, you know, being able to offer the advice that you had the benefit of to make sure that other people also have that benefit. And, you know, I'll say that I think that's even more significant for attorneys of color because um, it, as Jonathan mentioned from his own experience, it is rarer for us to find people who look like us doing what we do. And so the impact you can have, particularly when you, when you are encountering uh, an attorney of color, but even if you're not, of uh, being able to be a resource to someone in some way, um, the, it has an outsized importance for not only that person, but the people who are in the field generally, lawyers generally, because the numbers, as everyone I'm sure is aware, in the environmental field and in the legal industry generally are, are not so great uh, when it comes to attorneys of color. And anything that, you know, personally, I feel anything we can do to kind of help improve that and help see others be successful, as many of us who are speaking on, on this panel have been, um, can only be a benefit to the larger um, field of environmental law and the legal industry itself. Thank you all for sharing that really great advice. Um, my next question are, what are some of the key factors that you all use in deciding whether or not a company or an organization is the right fit for you? Marissa, can you start us off? Yeah, definitely. So um, I'm gonna preface everything I say by the first time I ever intentionally thought about this was when I made my most recent job transition, which just happened in August of this year. Um, and, and the reason why I consciously thought about it was because I've worked in a variety of different spaces, um, many of which had some sort of significant diversity and equity and inclusion issues. And what I can say is no matter how great the work is and no matter how much success you have, those issues ultimately become suffocating. And so it is really, really important that when you're picking a place to work, you think about those things at the outset. Um, and so when I you know, went about looking at the company that I currently work for, I did a lot of investigation into, okay, what does their board look like? Um, what does their exec team look like? Um, and, you know, their board was, had several people of color. Their exec team was 50% women. There was a black woman on their exec team. Um, you know, I had the, the luxury of doing this in a time when, you know, the events of the summer had just happened and I was able to look at their messaging around it. What did they say? Did they say the right thing? Did they say the wrong thing? And so, um, you know, I say all that to say, if you want to have the best experience, if you want to have the most success, if you want to be in a place that's going to support you, it's really, really important that you consider all of those factors at the beginning. Thank you. Um, Roy, can you also tell us a little bit about what you think on this topic? Sure. Um, I would say that echoing what, what Marissa said, considering those things, those factors on the, at the outset, um, I think that now having the experience of working at, you know, I've been in private practice my entire career, but having been at a very large firm, now being at a smaller firm, still a decent size, mid-sized firm, um, I wanted to have a better understanding of what it looks like for how people work together at that firm, right? Um, there are many ways to structure teams. There are, you know, some places you're kind of on an island and the, you get things assigned to you and you just go and do the tasks you're given. You don't really have great context for why you're doing what you're doing. Um, and the expectation is, you know, you'll figure it out, spit back out some work product or what have you and, and go do the next thing. Other models, you know, it's very collaborative where there's a team of several attorneys and you meet weekly to talk about what's going on in the case. And okay, here's what we need to do next. What's the status on that? Let's, let's talk about your ideas on this so we can make sure we hone it to the, you know, expectations of the client, all that good stuff. Um, and so just finding out how people work together, um, whether, the organization is incredibly hierarchical or not, right? You know, if you have to know that, okay, that there's some expectation that you need to have a certain type of deference to anyone who, who's been, you know, more seasoned than you, then that might be fine for you. But it also might be a source of frustration because some people, you've got good ideas, you think they're worth sharing, and then that gets 
you know, stifled because arbitrary reasons like, well, you've only been practicing law for three years, so you, your, your ideas must not be that important, right? Um, so I think really, I think it goes back to what Sam originally said about the importance of enjoying the people you work with. And part of that is just figuring out how people there work together um, and getting a sense of what that is. And that comes from talking to the people there. If you can find out people who have worked there before, you know, they're probably great to speak with as well, but that's gonna be a key part of determining whether it's a fit for you. And also remember that, you know, as you go along in your career, you're going to evolve in terms of what works well for you or how you like to do things. And it's okay for that to change over time, just being aware that wherever you are presently, it fits. Um, so I, I, I'll leave it at that. Thanks, Roy. Jonathan, how do you make that decision? Sure, I, I'm gonna, the theme for, for this answer for me is, you know, I look for a place that is welcoming and intentional about my personal and professional development. And I'm going to first tell a story where that didn't happen. Um, you know, during law school, you interview for a lot of a lot of jobs. I interviewed for a, a, a job at a, a mid-sized law firm, um, and one of the first questions in the interview, the first question, wasn't, um, you know, why were you in this joint degree program where you have like a master's in a law degree? It wasn't why did you join this environmental law program. The question was why didn't my dad change change his name when he immigrated to this country? Now. Thinking about, again, that concept, that theme of welcoming, that pretty much tanked my interest in working for that law firm. It tanked the interview. We went through the motions. Ultimately, that was not a good fit. That's the main thing. I, and and I, that's probably why the theme for me is being welcoming and intentional about my personal and professional development, that exact experience. Um, and, and so I'm going to unpack that a little more in a positive way. Um, what I'm looking for is not just like being friendly. I'm looking for welcoming and being intentional about my development, about what processes are in place from the moment I join that are going to enhance my personal and professional development. And to, Mar to Marissa's point, you need to do your due diligence on the companies you wanna join. Can you find anything about, for example, mentorship programs on their website? Um, and that's been a major part for, for Xerox with me from the moment I joined, they've identified mentors, not only in OGC, uh, in Office of General Counsel, but outside of that. And that's, that's important, not just traditional mentorship, but reverse corporate mentorship as well. I was mentoring someone who was a, a senior leader in the company and, and that, and then they weren't a, a, a lawyer at all. And that broadened, they were actually in marketing and that broadened my understanding of what they do. And that actually helped me to be a better attorney as well. Um, so what can you find out about mentoring before you decide to join? Ask that question during an interview process, because that shows you whether that will help you identify and determine whether or not they're actually welcoming and intentional about your development. Um, do they have on their website caucus groups? And I'm going to talk a little bit about my experience with um, Xerox has a bunch of caucus groups for um, Black employees, LGBTQ plus employees, um, uh, women employees and a part, as a part of the Women's Alliance, which is the caucus group um, for, for women, they have a program called the Ambassador Program. And I always bring this up because this has been also one of the fundamental pivots I've, or fundamental things I've learned as being a ambassador is knowing when to stand up as an ally and knowing when to let someone else stand up. And so again, if you find these things out about a company before you join, the, the, like that will tell you whether or not you wanna be a part of that organization. And, and so for me, it's again, that concept, are they welcoming and are they intentional about your personal and professional development? And Google, ask about it, find out, because um, I think that's critical. Thank you, I think that's really good advice. Um, Marissa, my next question is for you. What do you believe is the most interesting or exciting aspect of your role that other people may not know? I think the most interesting and exciting aspect of environmental law is sort of the diversity of the practice, right? There's not a lot of practice areas where you have the opportunity in your career to do litigation, transactions, policy. Um, you know, you get to work for a variety of clients, you know, 
Um, you know, there are a lot of people that like, you know, let's say are contract lawyers and they spend their lives like looking at 10 different forms and that's all they do for their entire career. And I would say that, you know, environmental law is absolutely the opposite of that. But I also think, which others have touched on earlier, that this is a practice area where you have the ability to touch and impact people's lives. Um, and, you know, I think that when you talk about Sam and Courtney, like it's readily apparent and obvious to all of you guys that they're doing the good work, right? And they are, you know, their mission is touching and impacting people's lives. But I would also say that, you know, working in big law, working in corporate America, there's something to being able to go to the C-suite and command their attention and get them to do things that are important and that are also impacting lives. Um, and I would just say, I think it's really, really important that we have all sorts of people, diverse people working on all sides of these issues, right? So um, I'll leave it there because we're, we're running out of time. Thank you. Um, so I just want to remind the audience that you can put any questions that you have for the panelists in the question answer box. I'm going to ask this last question and we're going to do a lightning round um, from each of you. It's what recommendations do you have for a new attorney interested in exploring a career in environmental law? So Sam, I'm going to ask you to go first. Yeah, kick ass at whatever you do in your first job and then then figure it out because the the I, I'm looking at all the names of the people on here. With one phone call, I could find out how good these people are at their job because we, I have a network of people and I don't hire people unless I know that this person is a proven performer. And you may not love your job, you may not love your boss, you may have made some of the mistakes that people here have made, but do not make the mistake of thinking that you can not do a great job and find a better one to fix it. Um, your performance matters. All right. Oh, you're on mute. Sorry about that. Uh, learn how to use Zoom. No, I'm kidding. Anyway, um, so piggybacking on what Sam said, uh, in, in addition to doing a great job, keep perspective, right? Your career is a very long one. And if you are not stepping into that prized position in, you know, for that NGO in the government for EPA or at that law firm, right out of law school, it doesn't mean that that's not a path that you can still um, follow, right? The, the goal is, and the focus is, go somewhere where you can get some great experience, do some interesting things, um, do an excellent job there, and you'll have a wealth of opportunities available to you. Um, and so I would just say, be flexible and, and keep the long view on your career, right? Because um, there's, as you can tell from the panel, such a wide array of things you can do touching on environmental law. And you can be like Jonathan and be in kind of every sphere and touch on them, um, or Sam as well. But you know, either way, you, you have time to land on that one that is just perfect for you. And in the meantime, you'll be doing interesting work and you'll be doing a great job at it. So it still can be fulfilling for your career. Courtney? So like Roy just said what I was gonna say, which was my advice was don't wait for the perfect job because you know, you, you're gonna have to just get a job that's close to what you want to do and do a great job in that job. And, and so Roy and Sam basically said that. I don't want to be repetitive. Thanks, Marissa. I'm going to give some really practical advice. Get involved in local, regional, national um, environmental law organizations. These are volunteer organizations. They will take help from anybody and it is the best way to increase your network in this space. Jonathan? Marissa, you know, <laughs> literally took what, uh, the words out of my mouth. Uh, no, so just, I'm gonna just echo um, what Marissa just said. Um, Marissa and I um, are both, we both participate and volunteer in the American Bar Association of Environmental Law. I'm the membership and diversity officer. Um, in addition to everything everyone else said about doing a good job, remember the importance of networking through those organizations. Um, there's, there are people in, in, in SEER, the section of environment, I know I can call today who are much smarter than me <laughs> about a bunch of different topics and I can pick their brain about, you know, I basically ask them and call them up and say, am I being an idiot about this? Like that's the level of relationship you can have with someone. And as an environmental lawyer, you need to know, are you being an idiot? Like that's just, 
like an important thing in addition to um, excelling at the, the role you're hired to do, keep an eye on those networks, identify those, those organizations. And the same advice applies there. Get involved with those organizations, again, that are intentional about your development. And, and that, that not only applies to your employer, but the, any organization you're going to be getting involved with and volunteering with, so. Thanks, Jonathan. I think the best piece of advice is make sure you find someone who tells you for being an idiot. No, um, thanks everyone. We're gonna move on to Q&A really quickly. Um, the first question is just for the women on the panel. Um, our attendees wanna know what advice do you have for women of color who are on track to leadership in an organization? Um, I think be unapologetically yourself, right? I think like uh, there's a, there are a lot of people in this space who don't feel comfortable coming to work as their real self. And I don't think you can ever be successful or happy in any organization unless you're you. So do what you need to do to be successful. Courtney. I'm writing down what Marissa said. <laughs> That's right. Um, no, and I would also say, um, don't um, don't explain too much. And I and this is this is kind of a I don't want to. Um, I would say this for women in particular as a leader. Um, for instance, don't explain. I, one thing that I I recently stepped into a new position. And Sam knows this because he um, hired me. Um, I, I didn't um, field questions, but like explaining how I got the job. I'm like, the polls have closed and um, I have the job. And, uh, you know, those types of questions were met with um, silence because I feel like, you know, those aren't necessarily the types of questions men would field. And I don't know that it could be the case that that would, they would have gone to men. But I think as women, we have to, you know, be comfortable in our own skin own the leadership position, be who we are, and um, not explain things that are not typically asked of every other leader. So just don't engage. That's really great advice, Courtney, thanks. Um, how do folks on the panel manage feelings of imposter syndrome in their careers? I, I typed this into the, into the chat, but I'll, I'll, uh, I'll say it out loud. I mean, the nicest thing to do is to realize that everybody around you feels it too. So if you don't feel it, you're the imposter. The, the really confident, successful people are the ones that creep me out. I feel imposter syndrome every day. Most people looking at my resume would be like, how could this guy feel imposter syndrome? Well, right. How could you feel imposter syndrome? You're doing it to yourself. That's okay. We all do it. Live with it. I agree 100%. And I would say it also helps to surround yourself with people who will help build you up and look for ways for you to grow, right? And so, you know, it's, it's, it's hard enough to have a conversation with yourself to remind yourself that, you know, I'm, this is an imposter syndrome moment, but calm down, or it's not that serious, or I'm doing great, or I'm, I'm making it, I'm fine. But it's helpful to have that reinforcement that you, you know, built relationships with people who will remind you like, you're amazing at this, what are you talking about? Or, you know, get out of your own head, you know, they don't know it either, or they're figuring it out, and you will figure it out as well. Um, and so, you know, that goes back to that piece that Jonathan mentioned about, um, you know, building that those networks, you know, he can, he can call someone in ABA, you know, have someone you can call, not only will they say, yeah, don't do that, that's stupid, they'll also say, and you know, good thing you didn't, but anyways, you're still doing a great job, don't worry about it, keep it up. And that is really important, too, because there's, there's always going to be constant pressures that will make you kind of start to question yourself a little bit, especially when you're an attorney of color in, in these spaces. Other folks want to share thoughts? Okay, I'm going to move on to our next question. How has working remotely changed your working style or your strategy of creating impactful work? I can feel that one because we went remote um, six weeks after I started in my position in the New York office. And um, one of the things I did based upon um, some tips we got from experts in remote work was I started really kind of reaching out and touching people more because I'm still getting to know them. And so it's, it's been a big shift though, because I think it's easier to lead in person 
Um, so working remotely has required a lot of um, reaching out across video or phone. But one thing I want to say about it too, though, is it's allowed us as leaders to demonstrate that we trust people to be doing their work. And it's allowed us to empower our employees to like handle things without someone standing there and standing over them. And so I think in a lot of ways, it's also been a really great opportunity. So, you know, with every challenge that there's good opportunity and that that's what it's shown me is that I see that teams can perform without someone standing there watching them. That's wonderful. And the thing I would add is the power of meeting in person. Now that we're kind of working like virtually, people often reach out, have reached out to me over the year we've been in this pandemic. And most of the time when I'm like, okay, if this is a serious issue, then we need to go in, we need to go into the office and discuss this face to face. Like it's not working. It's amazing how quickly that problem goes away. But more importantly, so from a priority standpoint, we can figure this out without actually going into the office. But those times when I actually had to go into the office for a variety of reasons, um, they were important. And so it, it does show you, it does show one, you, you can do this work remotely, but there's a strategy I think to employ to say, all right, for those really important issues where we either are doing a document review, there's an inspection from a regulatory agency, we will go in and do those and we'll do those together safely but we need to prioritize. Like if we can't figure this out over vir like virtually, then let's prioritize and figure out when we're going in and how we're going to tackle this as efficiently as possible. Uh, because, you know, we really want to minimize going into the office as much as we can. Thanks. Our last question is, is there a chance to connect with each of you around advice you might have? Is everyone willing to connect with folks in our audience? <laughs> um, if you would like to connect with any of them, please feel free to be in touch with Bethany. Her contact information is on the NYU bio page for her, and she'll be able to connect you with any of our really wonderful panelists. Um, I want to ask each of you to just, if you have any last words, things you didn't get to say on the panel that you wanted to talk about, now is your opportunity. Just LinkedIn, like when connecting, um, I am one of those people who will just straight up like connect with someone on LinkedIn I've never met because I think they're cool. Normally I get rejected, but I'm, I'm comfortable with that by now in, in my career. But like, feel free, reach out to, to uh, well, I'm gonna say us, but reach out to any of us, I think via LinkedIn um, and, and you can find us, I think, and I won't hesitate to accept. <laughs> just just tell me a little bit, like I know you from this thing and then I, that's fine, <laughs> that's fine. I feel exactly the same way. I say yes to every single LinkedIn invite, every single request for coffee, virtual or in-person that I get from anyone I, I meet during one of these speaking opportunities. So I'm happy for Bethany to give out my email. You can connect with me on LinkedIn. I'd love to talk to any of you. I'm always open for that. Well, I'm just gonna be the, the broken record here and say um, definitely um, reach out connect LinkedIn, email me, whatever. Um, one thing I will say is anytime people make this offer, please take them up on it. Um, and that should be something you, you kind of implement personally throughout your career because that's how you build that network. That's how you create relationships. That's how you get access to information you wouldn't otherwise have. I know it's made a huge difference in my career once I figured it out like five years in um, <laughs> um, and missed a bunch of opportunities because I didn't do that. Um, and so definitely reach out. And I will say, particularly for attorneys of color, it, it is imperative because one, you know, the world is not that big, particularly of people that practice in this space. I mean, I, I've, met, I've met Sam for the first time, but I'm sure that we were probably one degree of separation in terms of who we both know. Just like he said, he can call someone and find out if, you know, I'm completely full of it or I'm not good at my job. I've, I've worked with Marissa previously on something else. I work, I'm on ABA SEER and, and Jonathan is my leader on the membership committee. You know, we all cross paths, right? So um, take advantage of that and happy to be a resource, whether it's talking about working at a law firm, whether it's getting connected to people who do other things because the network is such that if I don't do it, I know someone who does. So please take advantage of that. Do other folks have any final last words? All right. Well, thank you so much for being on our panel today. I'm actually going to kick it over to Bethany um, to say a few words. 
Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for that incredibly inspiring and in panel. And it was full of information that's helpful to me. And I'm sure it will be helpful to our audience. I, I really appreciate that you all mentioned the importance of local bar associations. That's wonderful. It's so great. Um, you know, we at the Environmental Law Committee at the New York City Bar are really focused on building our DEI practices and really looking to recruit and make our um, our committee as inclusive and and you know full of diverse perspectives as possible. You know, we're also very focused on that at NYU at my work at NYU, and I um I I just am so grateful to to the panelists today for shining a light on this and on this important issue and helping us all you know learn about the different ways to practice this law and um and learn from you. Thank you all for being here. Thank you, Adrian and Green 2.0 and all of our wonderful co-sponsoring organizations for the support for this panel series. And we hope we'll see you here on, on April 15th for our panel that will focus on, on an environmental justice case study. Thank you all so much. <laughs>